Why was 2016 one of the craziest years in sports? Well, I'm gonna tell you, that's the point of this video. 2016, in those 12 months, we witnessed the assassination of Harambe, the gorilla, Brexit, and of course, one of the most important political figures of our lifetime. Kin bone. But it's hard to fathom that as crazy as the world was becoming in 2016, that also extended into the world of sports. We saw two teams break curses to win championships, the most famous kneel down in NFL history, a 5,000 to 1 odds champion, and the greatest comeback in Super Bowl history. Well, sorta. That last one took place in 2017, but I'll cover both Super Bowls. This is 2016, the craziest year in sports, and it all starts with me? Uh, they spelled my name incorrectly, but I'll I'll be waiting to answer questions anytime. Can you believe they let me in to cover Super Bowl 50? Uh, well, that was played on February 7th, 2016 at Levi Stadium in Santa Clara, California. The Denver Broncos faced off against the Carolina Panthers led by league MVP Cam Newton. Now, Peyton Manning's Broncos entered the game as five-point underdogs thanks mostly to a woefully inconsistent and at times incompetent offense and Manning himself was trying to fend off father time for 60 more minutes. Four neck surgeries from 2011, plantar fasciitis in his foot and the weight of that thousand pound forehead was a lot for the sheriff to carry. Luckily, he had an all-time NFL defense to carry him for the first time in his career ever. The Denver Broncos defense won the Super Bowl while carrying me. Now, despite having a human body with the medical equivalent of an age of 68, Peyton Manning showcased his experience, leadership, and football IQ throughout the game. The Broncos defense did the heavy lifting, led by Super Bowl MVP Von Miller, causing three turnovers, including an early defensive touchdown that set the tone for the game. Von Miller, thanks again, pal. I owe you. This performance allowed Peyton Manning and the offense to settle for field goals and ride CJ Bash Mandersonic to glory in the fourth quarter with the surprise boost from punt returner Jordan Norwood, who set the record for longest return in Super Bowl history at the time with the 61 yard rip. That was just broken by Kadarius Toney and the Chiefs. While his statistical performance may not have been as eye popping as in some of his earlier seasons, his presence on the field and ability to not fuck up at critical moments gave the Broncos just enough in his final shift as the sheriff. Winning Super Bowl 50 was a storybook ending for Peyton Manning, one of the best to ever play the game. It allowed him to retire on the highest note possible, kiss Papa John, and solidify his legacy as the greatest QB ever, no debate. Also, Cam Newton pouted off the stage after losing the big game. Later that spring, though, we got another storybook finish in a championship game. North Carolina and Villanova faced off at NRG Stadium in Houston on April 4th, and in the final seconds, we witnessed a play, a moment that would be etched in sports history as one of the most dramatic finishes in college basketball, second only to Rick Pitino uh, prematurely ejaculating at an Italian restaurant. Now, as the game clock dwindled down in the final seconds, and with the score tied at 74 to 74, Villanova had possession of the ball for one last shot. With just a few seconds remaining, the ball ended up in the hands of junior forward Chris Jenkins. And in a moment that would define his legacy in Villanova's championship run, Jenkins launched a three. As time expired, the shot through the net just as the buzzer sounded and the crowd erupted in disbelief and excitement. The shot gave Villanova a 77-74 victory and secured their second NCAA championship in school history. And with the Panthers losing the Super Bowl and the Tar Heels the championship in just a couple months span, it was a rough stretch for Carolina. Now, Jim Nance nearly lost his mind, and so did all of us watching at home. Luckily, Tony Romo and Jim Nance hadn't started broadcasting together. Otherwise, Romo's psychic abilities would have spoiled this electric ending for Nance. 
Today's episode is sponsored by Underdog Fantasy, and this week they have a mystery pick'em special, which is an exclusive offer for new customers. All you have to do is sign up at Underdog with my link below or code that's good. Make your first deposit, which Underdog will match up to $100, and then head to the lobby to see which player special you got. It's part of a five pick special, so your mystery player gives you a freebie there. This is for their pick'em game where you make higher or lower picks on player stat totals or fantasy points for a game. Plus, there's a week one special for all existing underdog users with Patty Mahomes. All Mahomes has to do is get more than a half yard and you win. So get your picks in before the game and there's just days, nay hours left to enter in the Best Ball Mania 4 tournament for your shot at winning $3 million to first place. Again, link below, code that. That's good. Sign up at Underdog for this incredible special and that mystery pick em. Ooh, who will it be? Ooh. In college football, we got the Alabama Crimson Tide and the Clemson Tigers playing in a game that featured 85 points, 740 passing yards as Nick Saban captured his fourth title in seven seasons. This was an interesting game as the NCAA tried out a new rule, no defense allowed. This game was riddled with future NFL stars. Derrick Henry had three touchdowns and 158 rushing yards. Deshaun Watson, who had only been allowed to be massaged by men at this point, threw for 405 yards, four touchdowns, and a pick. Calvin Ridley was barely used in this game, which should tell you how stacked Alabama was. And who could forget Bama QB Jake Coker? Who the hell is Jake Coker? Cocker? Is it Cocker? I don't know, but the star for Alabama was the greatest OJ to ever play football and also not murder his ex-wife. Green eggs and ham and OJ is guilty. OJ Howard. While things didn't really work out for him at the NFL level, he had 208 receiving yards in this game from the tight end spot, which helped them become the 19th pick in the 2017 draft. Now Villanova was a a slight underdog, but nothing compared to the champions of the British Premier League. Leicester City's improbable Premier League victory in 2016 stands as one of the most remarkable underdog stories in the history of sports. Against staggering 5,000 to one odds, the team managed to defy all expectations and win the title, shocking the world of soccer, which I, I guess is most of the world. The Premier League typically features powerhouse teams with extensive financial resources and storied histories. For American sports fans, it's like if the Cowboys, Lakers, and Yankees were all in the same league. But Leicester City, on the other hand, was a club that had spent much of its history in the lower divisions of English football, barely dodging relegation the year before. Thanks to Ted Lasso, Americans now know what relegation means. As the season progressed, uh, Leicester City continued to defy expectations and climb up the standings. They pulled off stunning victories against top tier teams and somehow managed to maintain that magic through the whole season. It's really like if the Arizona Cardinals came out of nowhere to win Super Bowl 58 behind the arm of Colt McCoy. Colt McCoy, who I think some thought might be the Arizona Cardinals starter to begin the season, was officially released. <laughs> the climax of Leicester City fairy tale season came on May 2nd when Tottenham Hotspur, their closest competitors, were held to a draw by Chelsea. This result ensured that Leicester City could no longer be caught at the top of the league table, which is British for standings, and they were crowned Premier League champions for the first time in their history. One month later, another downtrodden franchise and city got their first ring as well. Cleveland! After LeBron James made the decision in 2010 to take his talents to South Beach, it felt like the Cleveland Cavaliers would forever be dormant in the NBA. The Browns were even worse, making Cleveland as a sports city a mecca of hell. But LeBron reversed course after a finals loss in Miami and headed back home to deliver the title that was so coveted when they passed up future legend Darko Milicic and drafted James in 2003. 
A lot of people take pride in hating LeBron James, but returning to Cleveland is one of the cooler things any athlete has ever done. With a less polarizing Kyrie Irving by his side and Kevin Love pulling in boards left and right, the Cavs had a dynamic squad that made it through the East and had the unenviable task of dispatching the 73-9 Juggernaut Warriors, the same team that had vanquished them a year before. Oh yeah, and they had to climb out of a 3-1 hole. The Cavs' odds to win were plus 1,100, 8%, and what ensued was one of the greatest comebacks in NBA history, orchestrated by one of the greatest players in NBA history, LeBron James and his testicles. Things changed with those testicles with one simple dick kick by Draymond Green and his suspension gave Cleveland the momentum to even up the series and force game seven in Oakland. With the game on the line, LeBron James changed history with the chase down block of Andre Iguodala before Kyrie Irving sunk a three that made me believe that the world is flat and gave Cleveland its first title since the Browns won the NFL championship in 1964, which doesn't even really count since Super Bowls didn't start till 67. 2016 was a gleeful year full of underdog stories like the ones I just mentioned, but there were plenty of somber moments as well. We said goodbye to the greatest boxer of all time, Muhammad Ali, when he died in June after a three decade battle with Parkinson's disease. A great way to understand that Ali was actually the GOAT is that nobody in the comments will be bitching that I called him the greatest boxer of all time. Except for some 80 year old Italian men saying it was Rocky Marciano. The Miami Marlins lost a young phenom when pitcher Jose Fernandez died in a boating accident in September. And just two days later, his teammate D Gordon honored Fernandez's legacy by hitting a leadoff home run in the first at bat since Jose's death. Gordon to right, it's deep. If you don't watch baseball, I'd just like to point out that D. Gordon was far from a power hitter. In fact, he's hit all of 18 home runs in his 11 year career. And that home run in 2016, that was his only one that entire season and it couldn't have come at a more powerful moment. And speaking of firsts, Bartolo Colon hit his first home run at age 42. We said goodbye to another legend in 2016 when Kobe Bryant played his last game on April 13th. Even with his body failing him like Peyton Manning a couple months earlier, Kobe played over 42 minutes and dropped the last 60 points of his career in a narrow win over the Utah Jazz, firing up 50 shots, 40 more than any other Laker that night because why the hell not? The thing that had me cracking up all night long was the fact that I go through 20 years of everybody screaming to pass the ball. And on the last night, they're like, don't pass it. <laughs> you guys will always be in my heart. And uh, I sincerely, sincerely appreciate it. No words can describe how I feel about you guys. What can I say? Mamba out. In hindsight, Kobe's final game holds a deeper significance now than it did at the time. His death along with his daughter Gianna and seven others was a tragic, untimely loss of life that makes the final game that he played in much more special than we knew at the time. But even at the time, that final act was an event that we haven't seen the likes of since. We knew Kobe was old, he was broken down, and still we cheered him on as he took way too many shots and somehow willed the lake to a meaningless victory. It was fun. Quite the opposite of watching Tom Brady throw it 66 times in a loss to the Cowboys in his final game in 2023. Of course, that wasn't the only big story surrounding the Lakers in 2016. Back in March, the locker room imploded when rookie D'Angelo Russell secretly videotaped teammate Nick Young admitting to cheating on his fiance Iggy Azalea. The footage leaked Young, AKA Swaggy P, got outed as an adulterer, and he and Russell were obviously at odds. So the Lakers had a decision to make, get rid of Young or Russell. And of course they got rid of the 19 year old future all-star. 
one of the many great roster moves the Lakers have made in the past 10 years. In the NHL, Sidney Crosby won MVP of the playoffs and led the Pittsburgh Penguins to their first Stanley Cup since 2009. So not really that long. They'd go on to win another in 20 cents. You know what? Uh, let me just bring in someone who actually knows hockey. Yeah, urinating tree. So Mr. Brandon, you wanted to figure out what happened in the hockey world in 2016. Well, I got one thing to say to that, sir. <clears throat> the Pittsburgh Penguins were the greatest team in the history of teams. They dominated their foes after December, of course, because they were trash early on in the year. But then, the miracle happened. They changed nearly everything on their roster. They hired a new coach. They emphasized speed. They brought in the youth. Matt Murray was a god. Everything came up, Penguins. We made the Capitals into a gigantic meme again, and it was a glorious sight, them being humiliated after the President's Trophy. And it ended with San Jose suffering pain in the Stanley Cup Final. That was our birthright, that was our honor, and it was the greatest celebration we had in 10 years. We had waited a long time. There was a lot of bullshit in between that. There were also some other things that happened in the year. There was a World Cup of Hockey in 2016, but we don't... We don't really talk about that. It's one of those like fever dreams, kind of like listening to Pink Floyd while high. It just, it just happened. That's right, buddy. Aren't you a good little sock puppet? Mm-hmm. The Penguins definitely are going back to the Stanley Cup this year. No, buddy. You're definitely not being held hostage because I'll kill your family if you say no. Mm-mm-mm-mm. Thank you so much, Tree. Make sure you subscribe to his YouTube channel, Urinating Tree. He covers all sports all the time and does it better than pretty much everyone. In the PGA, the sport was marked not by what was happening, but by what wasn't. Tiger Woods withdrew from the PGA Championship, and it was the first time in his golf career that he missed all four majors in a season. It was truly the beginning of the end for Woods as he hadn't fully recovered from his 2015 back surgeries. Now golf still had Phil Mickelson, who was probably betting a cool 50 mil that year, Rising Stars and Dustin Johnson who won the US Open by four strokes, Jordan Spieth and Rory McElroy. But none of them brought in attention like Tiger Woods and I think of 2016 as the year golf died. That summer though, we were treated to the the Olympics, this time in Rio. Swimmer Michael Phelps became the first American male swimmer to qualify for his fifth Olympics. Phelps won another gold in the 200 meter butterfly and at age 31, he became the oldest male champion and the oldest individual champion in Olympic swimming history. Phelps would end his Olympic swimming career with 23 gold medals and 28 total. His 23 golds are more than double that of Mark Spitz, who has the second most at nine. Now as Phelps said goodbye to the chlorine, Katie Ledecky set a pair of world records and left Brazil with four gold medals around her neck. Not to mention Simone Biles became the most decorated female American gymnast at the age of just 19. Now, she's married to some somebody on the Green Bay Packers. And not to be outdone, swimmer Ryan Lochte had a bizarre encounter with a good old fashioned stick up in Rio. Or at least that's what they said. According to Lochte's initial account, he stated that they were pulled over by men with badges who then robbed them of their belongings. Lochte's dramatic recounting of the incident to the media contributed to the creation of an international incident and fueled concerns about the safety and security at the Rio Olympics. However, as Brazilian authorities began to investigate the incident, further inconsistencies emerged in the swimmer's story. Video footage from a gas station showed the swimmers vandalizing a restroom, which with enough Chipotle, aren't we all a little guilty of vandalizing a bathroom at some point? Did you have fire in your gut? Anyway, they were also confronted by security guards, but there was no evidence of a robbery. It was later revealed that the swimmers had fabricated the story to cover up their own misbehavior. Shitty behavior. Because it was in the bathroom. Now, as the truth came to light, Lochte faced severe backlash from the media, fans, and fellow athletes for his dishonesty and for tarnishing the reputation of the Olympic Games. Sponsors dropped him 
and he was widely criticized for disrespecting the host country and its people. Lochte eventually issued a public apology for his actions and admitted to exaggerating the details of the incident. And Olympic officials took away his right to pee in the swimming pool during any future competition. That was the one that stung. Now, backlash seemed to be a theme in 2016. Not long after Lochte's incident, Colin Kaepernick took the most famous kneel down by any quarterback in NFL history. Kaepernick's decision to kneel during the national anthem was inspired by his desire to raise awareness about social injustices and to use his platform as a professional athlete to spark conversations about these issues. There are a lot of things that are going on that are unjust, people aren't being held accountable for, and that's something that needs to change. He believed that the United States was not living up to its ideals of freedom and equality for all, particularly for running quarter, sorry, people of color. By taking a knee during the anthem, he aimed to draw attention to the fact that systemic racism and inequality persisted in American society. That was his intention, according to him. The message though that half of America took away from that was, He's disrespecting the flag. And if we let this stand, he's gonna turn our Bud Light gay! Now, the Kaepernick story was one of the biggest NFL stories of this past decade. The craziest thing is that I can just say the, the, the name Colin Kaepernick and it pisses people off to this day. I can say Kaepernick and it pisses people off more than if I say Deshaun Watson. That's just a fact. Now, Kaepernick's protest gained widespread attention, sparked intense debate across the country. Supporters praised him for using his visibility to shed light on important social issues and to peacefully protest for change. They argued that his actions were in line with the principles of free speech and peaceful protest, which are protected uh, by uh, the Constitution. Now, Kaepernick faced a ton of backlash, particularly from those who believed that kneeling during the national anthem was disrespectful to the flag, to the military, and to the country as a whole. Critics accused him of being unpatriotic and disrespectful to the sacrifices made by the military. The controversy surrounding his protest became a central topic of discussion, not only in sports, but also in politics and in the media. Now, people like to pretend that athletes being uh, involved in political issues is new, but it's it's been a thing forever. I mentioned Muhammad Ali earlier in this episode. He, Jim Brown, all activists who used their platforms to try and bring attention to issues that were important to them. Many other athletes across different sports began joining Kaepernick's protest by kneeling or taking similar actions during the national anthem. This sparked a national conversation about the intersection of sports and social issues, and it highlighted the power that athletes have as influencers and activists. As a result of his protest, uh, Kaepernick faced challenges in his career, I'd say. He became a free agent after 2016 and never played again, leading to accusations of blackballing by the NFL and the league owners. And now that half of you stopped watching just because I said Colin Kaepernick's name, let's get to something fun, the Chicago Cubs. One of the oldest and most iconic teams in Major League Baseball. They hadn't won a World Series championship since 1908, perhaps thanks to the curse of the Billy Goat, which was believed to have been placed on the team in 1945 when a tavern owner named Billy Cyanus and his pet goat were ejected from a World Series game at Wrigley Field but the 2016 season marked a turning point for the Cubbies. Under the leadership of analytics guided manager Joe Madden, general manager Theo Epstein, uh, no, no, no relation to the other one. Theo has never even visited an island just to be safe. And with a talented roster of players, including Chris Bryant, Anthony Rizzo, and Jake Arrieta, the team dominated the regular season with a 103 to 58 record, the best in baseball that year. Now, after reaching the NLCS the year before, the Cubs made it to the World Series where they met another perennial underdog, the C-Word Indians. Sorry, excuse me, I meant the Cleveland I-Words. And I want to tell you a little story about those Cleveland guys. In an ACLS matchup with the Toronto Blue Jays, Trevor Bauer was scheduled to pitch for Cleveland. The only problem was that he had hurt himself. 
No, nothing to do with baseball. He accidentally cut himself on a drone. <laughs> Whoa, uh, Americans aren't, aren't supposed to be the victims of drones, are we? With Cleveland up two to zero over the Jays, Bauer tried to tough it out and he started game three, but it took just a few batters for Bauer's wound to start dripping blood, forcing him out of the game. Despite losing their starting pitcher, the Indians won the series in five and were about to meet Chicago in the fall classic. But in this series, it was Cleveland, unlike the Cavs that jumped out to a three to one lead over the Cubs. But Chicago clawed its way back into the series and tied it up for game seven. Honestly, I'm not sure the city of Cleveland could have handled two championships in the same year. I think if that happened, we'd be saying 2016. Oh yeah, the year America lost the city of Cleveland when rabid fans burnt it to the ground in joy. It looked like the game was over, but then Raji Davis, who was having a terrible series to that point, did this. Davis's home run tied the game in unbelievable fashion, but before we could go to extra innings, a rain delay halted the most exciting World Series game in half a decade. But when it resumed, Ben Zobrist gave the Cubs a lead heading into the bottom of the 10th. With two outs, future Colorado Rocky Chris Bryant had a chance to end the game and he did it with a smile on his face. The Cubs ended the curse of the Billy Goat, one of the strongest curses in human history, and they flew the W atop the MLB for the first time in 108 years. Villanova, the Cavs, the Cubs, holy hell, what a great year for teams with very, very few championships. Clemson was knocking on the door for a title, but like we covered in January of 2016, they fell to Alabama in a back and forth offensive showcase. This time, they were back. Deshaun Watson was making a case as a first round prospect and Alabama's Jalen Hurts was doing it all as a freshman for the Tide. When the two teams met in Tampa, the first half was honestly sloppy. But the offenses began to erupt late in the game with just over two minutes left. Jalen Hurts broke off a 30 yard run that gave Bama a three point lead, leaving just enough time for Deshaun Watson in the Clemson offense to lead one final drive. And with the game in the balance, they did this. Scored, they scored. We had to use stills. It was the most dramatic championship finish in college football since Vince Young won it for Texas. And it couldn't have happened to a better guy. Yeah, I'm talking about Hunter Renfro. Now you familiar with uh, Deshaun Watson? Oh, he's nasty. Never been in trouble. Never been in trouble. Now there was another team that was no stranger to winning, a team I'm surprised didn't draft Renfro, and they were about to secure their fifth championship and it didn't come easy. I started this episode with the NFL and the world champion Denver Broncos. Although their win came in 2016, technically that was the 2015 season. So let's wrap this up with the 2016 NFL season. One of the biggest surprises in the NFL in 2016 was the Cowboys and their rookie quarterback, Dak Prescott, taking the reins of the Cowboys offense after Tony Romo suffered a broken back. Prescott went on to win NFL Rookie of the Year. The Cleveland Browns had just moved on from Johnny Manziel and would head into 2017 with the first overall pick after going 1-15 with quarterbacks Cody Kessler, Josh McCown, RG3, Kevin Hogan, and Charlie Whitehurst all throwing passes for the team that year. But let me rewind for a second because back in 2014 in the AFC Championship game, the New England Patriots were accused of deflating footballs to help Tom Brady and his slippery baby hands grip onto the football. After a lot of appeals and delayed punishment and destroyed phones, Roger Goodell finally caught up to Tom Brady and suspended him for the first four games of the 2016 season. The Pats turned to quarterbacks Jimmy G and Jacoby Brissett, who navigated the Brady ban with a 3-1 record. System QB confirmed. When Brady returned, he did so with a vengeance, though, throwing for 3,500 yards, 28 TDs, just two picks with a passer rating of 112 in just 12 games, 
for number 12. I think it's honestly one of the greatest spite seasons in NFL history. Brady's interception percentage was .5, the lowest of his career. And Brady has always been pretty smart with the ball. He used that spite to fuel the Patriots all the way to Super Bowl 51, where they met the Atlanta Falcons and league MVP Matt Ryan and the second leading receiver that season, Julio Jones. Now as a Patriots and Tom Brady hater, this was looking like my finest hour. The Falcons were efficient and deadly on offense in the first three quarters of the game. Brady threw a pick six before halftime and the Patriots were on the ropes. Does anyone remember what the score of that game was at half? 27-4, 29-2, something like that and then all hell broke loose. James White touched the ball about 200 times in the second half and found the end zone. The Falcons managed the clock like they were actively trying to lose the game. Julio Jones made the greatest catch that didn't matter, and Julian Edelman made one that was just even a little bit better. Another James White touchdown sent the game into overtime for the first time in Super Bowl history, and the Patriots choked the life out of the Falcons, putting them out of their misery with a third James White touchdown. It was heartbreaking, but it was a fitting way to end 2016, one of the craziest years in sports ever. Whatever I left out, please bitch about it in the comments. Thanks for watching That's Good Sports. Please subscribe here on YouTube for more deep dives into years of sports. Never been in trouble.